Hello brothers and sisters, uh, here we are once again for our Wednesday Bible study online. Uh, you know, we, we don't know exactly if we're going to keep doing this uh, from here on in, but at least for the time being we will. And uh, First of all, I want to thank you all for all your wonderful cards that uh, upon the passing of my mother, I really appreciate all your cards, your emails, your phone calls. Uh, your text and, uh, and and so forth. I uh, really appreciate it. Thank you very much for your support. And, and uh, but today we we want to start a uh, a series, and the series of the Wednesday Bible study is called "Cleanliness is Next to Godliness, Not." Uh, as you will see in just a minute, uh, we'll explain that. But before we start, uh, let us bow our heads for a word of prayer. Gracious God, we thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to open Scripture once again. And we pray that as we go about it, that you would inspire us, direct us, and speak to us directly. Uh, to the honor and glory of God, in Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> so, the, 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 the title, of course, is a, it's a play on... Uh, on words from the well-known saying uh, that says precisely that uh, cleanliness, cleanliness is next to godliness and of course it's talking about uh, being clean and having good hygiene and of course that uh, you know that's that's, that's a great it's an encouragement but the question is can the same be said about our salvation in our pursuit of holiness can the same thing be said in other words Do we need to be clean before we come to the Lord or not? And, uh, and so in fact, we come to the Lord because we are unclean, really. And He is the one who sanctifies us. He is the one who cleanses us. But I think that sometimes we put so much effort and so much time and, and we are completely distracted on what we can do and how we can cleanse ourselves that we don't run to Him instantly, immediately, every day so that He can cleanse us. That is a that is general thrust of, of our study uh, for now. So today we want to talk about uh, a lady named uh, Rahab. Uh, that I have titled just for our for our time together, um, an ugly past, and the story is in Joshua two. So we're going to delve into the the story of Rahab uh, to some de with some detail, but uh, let us uh, work through this together. Uh, the story of Rahab, the harlot shows the greatness of God's mercy and kindness and goodness. That is really the thrust of the story of Rahab. Uh, so she is a harlot. She is a, a prostitute by trade. That is her work. She's a prostitute. Uh, she's possibly, quite possibly, very young. Uh, so she's a young woman. Uh, there's no mention of a husband, there's no mention of children, but her family, if you notice in the story, it's very important. And when she talks about her family, she says, my father, my brother, my father, my mother, my brothers, my sisters. He doesn't, she never mentions anything outside of that. And twice she says that, my father, my mother, my brothers, my sisters. It's almost as if, as if she is saying that, as we say in Spanish, es hija de casa. In other words, uh, she is still under the, the canopy, the protection of the father. Uh, and so she's still somehow a part of the household, her dad's household. It, it's, it's quite possible. Uh, be that as it may, the Bible says that her house, or we could say maybe an apartment, but her house was really part of the wall. 
And as we know, uh, the walls of Jericho were very large, very, very wide. Uh, I don't remember if it's one chariot or two chariots wide or something, something to that effect. The point is that her house is on the wall. Um, and that's astounding, as you're going to see in just a minute. Nevertheless, she spends her days giving her body over for the pleasure of men for a price. That is what she does. Uh, and uh, so the Israelites come to Jericho, spy out the city, and when they are recognized, uh, they are looking for a place to hide. And so they go to this, to the house of Rahab, the harlot. Probably because, you know, she's not very, uh, she's not going to be very discriminate. Uh, she's not going to be rejecting too many visitors. So I suppose that's one of the reasons why they go there uh, to hide. And she does, in fact, uh, hide them, which was a very dangerous thing to do. But the reason that the Bible gives for, for her action uh, is because she knows, and she says it very clearly, she knows that the Lord God, Yahweh, has given the land, the land there she's, she's on, to Israel in verse 9. So even, even if we take Rahab's view to be that of a pagan, what she is saying is that the God of Israel is root plowing through the land. You know, she, they've come up from the Negev, and they've destroyed every kingdom along the way, and now they're poised at the Jordan River, and they're getting ready to skip over into, into the land of Israel. So she, has, she knows already that, that the God of Israel is a powerful God, more powerful than the other gods, including the God of Jericho. But she says also, in verse 11, the Lord, He, very emphatic in Hebrew, the Lord, He is the God of heaven and earth. In other words, He is the one true God, she is saying, she is, she is proclaiming. It's a statement of faith, I think, definitely. Without being noticed, brothers and sisters, this is without anybody explaining to her the Hebrew faith. The Ten, the Ten Commandments and the whole law of Moses has just been given, not, not, not a few years earlier. And so it's, it's a brand new, no one has explained it to her. But something has, has come up in her spirit and she, and she has embraced the God of Israel. So the spies promise to deliver her from the destruction that is coming if she will hang a scarlet thread Mind you, not a rope, a scarlet thread on her window, on the wall. So the story of, of Rahab doesn't happen in 2020. I mean, today, the prostitutes, uh, harlots as they were, as it were, uh, do not have a high place in our society. And today, there's drugs, there's violence, there's abuse, there's all kinds of things that go along with it uh, that may or may not have been present uh, some back in the time of Rahab, but, but not, turn the clock back 3,000 years and, you know, she, she, she has no future. She, she has nowhere to go. Uh, her, her, her name is, is tainted, uh, her body's tainted. Um, and and now with the law of Moses, the law of Moses has been get, has, has been given to the people of Israel. I mean, there's no hope for there for her even there, because the law of Moses prohibits harlots from existing in the people within the people of Israel. Moreover, uh, the sons the, that is the uh, the men are prohibited from marrying a harlot. Much and a, and a pagan harlot, uh, for that matter. So, what do you do uh, in a situation like that? But let's go on because this is this is the rest of the story. 
The Bible says that the walls, remember they, they go around seven, uh, six days and on the seventh day they, they yell. And the Bible says, and, and history uh, tells us also, archaeology tells us, that the walls fell out. The, the, the walls did not crumble this way or crumble inward. They, 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 it's as if somebody was on the inside and they pushed the walls out. But not Rahab's. Rahab's home on the wall was preserved. That's amazing. Just think about it. It's an amazing thing. And her and her, her whole family is saved. But there's something, there's another detail that, I, that came to my mind, brothers and sisters, as I was reading this and studying this. Uh, when Rahab hides the, the spies, what does the Bible say that she covered them with? Do you remember? Right. Correct. Flax. Flax. Now what is, what is flax for? Flax is used to make linen. Linen. So I, and this came to my mind, and it's not in the Bible. Uh, but if her home was on the wall, because remember when the spy, when she let, her, let out the spies, she had to let them down a rope. She had, a, she had to let them uh, bring a rope and, and have them slide down. So she was not like on, on level ground. She was above. So this came to my mind. If she had flax, she had linen. And if she had linen, I wonder if she took strips of linen, white linen, and made a rope so that they, so that she and her family could come down to safety. Where have we heard strips of linen just recently? But the last thing is that Rahab found an Israelite husband in time. She found an Israelite husband from the tribe of Judah. And his name was Salmon. He loved her, he married her, and he formed a home with her. And I quote from Matthew 1, verse 5. And it reads this way. And Salmon begat Boaz of Rahab the harlot. And Boaz begat Obed of Ruth. And Obed begat Jesse and Jesse begat David. That is the kind of stuff, that is the kind of stuff that God does, if I can say it that way. You know, she takes this, he takes this ugly life, this, this hopeless life, and he creates something beautiful and wonderful, and her great-grandson is King David himself. This is the greatness of the mercy of God as I see it in this story. So, what I'm saying, brothers and sisters, today is that you don't need to be unsoiled, cleansed and tidy to become holy or to be made holy. We need to get rid of that idea that that before I pray, before I read the Bible, before I go to church, before I worship, before I sing, before I, I even think about God, I need to cleanse myself, I need to tidy myself, because otherwise he, I am going to be rejected by God. That is false. That is not the Word of God. God takes you as you are, every day, every moment, even in the worst moment. He takes you and embraces you and He begins to remake you or continues to remake you and mold you and embrace you. So, let us come as we are 
And let us take courage from the story of Rahab, the girl with an ugly past. Father, bless your children right now where they are, that the name of Jesus might be glorified. In that precious name we pray, amen and amen.